So if you have your Bibles, as always, we, we like to come from the Word. And, uh, and so we're going to be today in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses and then we'll get into discussing what it is I believe the Lord would have us to speak about today. So 1 Peter chapter 1, let's begin. The Apostle Peter is speaking and he says, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers that are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, the grace and peace be unto you. He continues, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, He has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold which perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, a while back I did a teaching several months ago on uh, the, the trial of your faith and we, we looked at this particular portion of scripture from a different aspect then. But today uh, I'm going to speak to you based on what it is the Holy Spirit has been speaking to my heart over the last several weeks and months really. For those of you who have been with us for a while and those of you who have just joined, um, I encourage you to go back and listen to the messages that began this year. For those of you who remember um, those messages in particular, we began to deal with certain things out of the book of Revelation and what we believe uh, is now beginning to transpire on the face of the earth. So I encourage you to go back and look at those messages. But how did the year begin as we come to the close of July and we're, we're coming to the end of summer? Uh, with one month left to go, we're going to head into a fall uh, for the balance of the year that is going to be increasingly intense and is going to be increasingly uh, tumultuous. And, and, and really what I feel by the Spirit is that we're going to begin to see some things um, that will be unexpected, uh, but basically understand this, that what is about to happen, if we are in the season that we think we are, is that more intensity is coming on on the face of the earth and that goes without saying right it's not like I'm prophesying saying thus saith the Lord it is what though we garner when we look at the Word of God and begin to apply the pattern of it and the form of it and how God has dealt with nations and the world throughout history but there's something very unique here that the Apostle Peter is talking about when he begins to write uh, to us in first Peter those of you who've been with us, you know that one of the principles that we that we uh, hold to in the Word of God is that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. That can be found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And also the principle that the prophet Isaiah gave us in Isaiah chapter 46, 9 and 10, where he says that the Lord declares the end of all things from the beginning. In other words, what we see in history as God dealt with his people and the nations of the world at the beginning in the historical narrative were really types and shadows in, in a larger sense, in a prophetic sense of what would transpire at the end of time as the angel told Daniel. So it is with that in mind that when we come into this letter that Peter is writing and what I sense is coming in a greater measure upon the face of the earth is a persecution that is coming towards the body of Christ. One of the fallacies of the Western church, and particularly the church in the United States of America, is that it has this kind of idea that it is exclusively the church. 
many within the church across the United States don't really take the time to consider the plight and the peril of our brothers and sisters that is taking place even now as we speak around the world. Whether it be our brethren who are in China in prison for their faith, who have suffered great persecution for multiple years, or whether it be our, our precious African brothers and sisters who are constantly under the threat of death as they are uh, you know, uh, attacked and persecuted by, uh, by extremists in, and, and, uh, and false religion throughout the African continent. And you can basically go through most of the places of the world uh, where there are impoverished or dominated people, whether it be uh, someplace like a Venezuela or a Cuba, it's all over the world. But when it's come to the church in the United States and primarily the West, although I'll, I'll put this in there right now, it was an extraordinary thing that we began to see unfold as we came out of the 2020 pandemic and, and all the lockdowns, all the things that were being imposed upon uh, the West, especially. I'm thinking of, of the brethren in Canada, the, the brethren in, in, uh, in Australia, who, who we hear from, uh, New Zealand. The draconian things that came down on the church, the shutting of the church houses, the, the uh, lockdowns in your houses, people being arrested on the streets. If we go into, uh, into what's happening with the farmers right in the Netherlands and throughout uh, those regions of, of Western Europe, we're beginning to see an intensity rising uh, that is primarily becoming directed at the church. And it's going to increase. It's going to increase, and if you're paying attention, it's happening already, and it's coming. More and more people are uh, you know, being energized, if you will, by the, the power of the enemy flowing through them, and without shame now, basically putting forth their ideology, whether it be uh, moral degradation or, or whether it be uh, you know, the occult, which is more blatant and in our face now than ever before. All of it, if you have eyes to see, is not merely emitting from human consciousness by itself, but it's being energized and empowered by the wicked one. The reason that we are seeing so much chaos and the reason that the world seems to be coming apart at the seams at the moment is precisely because we have entered into prophetic time where the scripture is being fulfilled. Again, I, I encourage you, for those of you who haven't been with us, to go back and listen to those early messages from January and February. And I think you'll be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, astounded, really, at many of the things that have come to pass, just as the Lord was showing us back then, they're starting to happen. Whether it's the war that's increased, whether it's the food shortages, whether it's the economic devastation that's creeping up on everybody everywhere, whether it's the shortages that are coming into Western Europe. I saw an article the other day where they're telling their people in France and Germany they can't even take a hot shower, that they need to begin to train themselves because they're headed into a winter of discontent, if you will, where the shortages are going to increase. The food supplies, the starvation of the third world nations, but even Western society is coming up underneath these kinds of things. We can throw in the floods, the fires, the volcanoes, the earthquakes. All of these things are happening simultaneously, but also the things that the Lord said would happen, and that is wars and rumors of wars, like we've been witnessing the kinds of things that have been happening. So I'm just kind of brief, briefly hitting some bullet points there, but we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, what is it that we're witnessing? There's, there's, there's several kinds of groups of people emerging right now across the planet. But we're dealing primarily with the church. So what we want to focus on is that you might find that, you know, you have maintained your prayer life, you've maintained your study life, and so you are sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. But then we look at our brethren and our sisters that aren't as intense in the things of God, and it's as if they've settled into a, to a slumber, a malaise, if you will, almost a zombie-like going through life, almost as if we ignore what our eyes uh, see uh, as if it'll go away. But the truth of the matter is, if we have entered prophetic times, and I, and I, and I can honestly and, and pretty much 99.9% .9 of the way tell you, we are there. And we are not going to see things relent. It's not going to get better. Not for the church, not for the people of God, not for those who love the Lord. 
ultimately what we know from the prophetic scriptures is that the attention is going to be turned and that the focus is going to become on both the Jew and the Christian together. They will be persecuted. Read Revelation chapter 12 where it says that the enemy, the devil, has come down to you knowing that he has a short time. And so he moves, it says in Revelation chapter 12 verse 17, I believe it is somewhere in there, he moves against those that have the commandments of the Lord and those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There will be a concerted effort by the wicked one to come after God's people. And if you have eyes to see and you have any sort of spiritual perception at all, that is all around us now. And there is an intensity that we have never seen, especially in Christianized Western society, for the blatant disregard of the holy word of Almighty God and a, and a dislike and a hatred, if you will, on, in many fronts, in many quarters, for the church itself. The only thing standing in the way of a full takeover of the entire planet is the Holy Spirit who is holding back that complete global reset which they're trying feverishly to accomplish. Now, the reason I said all that is because this is what the Spirit of God has had me speaking in the churches where I've been and in the places and the people I've talked to over the last several months. It is this what Peter was writing and to whom he was writing to. Now let's just get into this really quick. First Peter chapter 1. First of all, you need to take note that he starts the letter with his Gentile name. He is one of the fathers, one of the foundation fathers of the church of Jesus Christ. His name is inscribed on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem, right? If you know your Bible. But he presents himself as Peter, not as Simon, his Jewish name but as Peter. And there's a, there's a, there's a reason for that. The first reason is, is that this, this is directed toward the Gentile church. Remember this, Jesus spoke of the times of the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 spoke of the judgment that came upon Israel completely and totally in AD 70 with the burning down of the temple, the scattering of the Jews to the four corners of the earth. You go read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you'll see there that what Paul said is that when that happened, it was the divine providence of God for it to happen. They first had to have the Messiah presented to them, and in, it, ultimately they would reject him. But remember, prior to that time, the only nation on the face of the earth that ever had the word given to it uh, in this extent was the Jewish nation, the 12 tribes of Israel, God coming down on Sinai, speaking the Ten Commandments to them, writing the Torah through Moses and then the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs and the like. This was given to Israel. And in her prophetic utterances, she was told that she was having, would have a Messiah that would come to her. And when he did finally appear, the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't recognize him. Some did, the early, the early believers did, but by and large, the ruling religious establishment of Israel refused him and rejected him. And as a result of that, uh, judgment would come down upon them which it did in A.D. 70 with the burning of the temple and the scattering of the Jews to the four corners of the earth. Now, why do I mention that? Because what Paul says was that at that time, God himself, our creator, counted them as being ignorant and fully understanding what the word of God was trying to reveal to them. That we were not looking for a conquering hero in the flesh, a great David or another Samson or another great king of Israel that would come and overthrow uh, the, the imperial Roman government and institute the kingdom of God in the natural world on earth through Israel. What Jesus said that he came to do first and foremost was to deliver us from the prison that we were in controlled by an insidious unseen master called Satan. He held every single human being in captivity and the kingdom that he was coming to first establish would be the kingdom of God within the hearts and lives of every single individual that would accept him as their Messiah. They would be ensured a protective covering by the sealing of their soul by the Holy Spirit who was sent down from above at the acceptance of what Christ did for us on the cross, testifying that his sacrifice was accepted when he rose again on the third day. By and large, the Jewish state rejected that. 
They even cried on the day of his trial, we have no God but Caesar. And so they and that generation sealed their fate. But put that aside for a moment and consider what the Holy Prophets revealed and what Paul the Apostle himself would tell us that this was done in order that the rest of us, that is all the non-Jewish nations of the world, would have the same opportunity, the same extended hand of mercy and grace from our Creator in heaven that the Jews had had up until that point. And in concluding them as being blind and and devoid of understanding of the true gospel of God and the covenant, the new covenant that he was bringing into the earth, he would be able at the end of time to once again turn his attention to them and attempt to bring them back to himself so that there would be one people, Jew and Gentile, one new man, the church of Jesus Christ, built out of both so that there would be one new expression of the church in the earth. This is what's happening. This is what's unfolding. But just as the Jewish people reached the apex after 2,000 years of revelation from God and then rejected God and so judgment came upon them, so the Lord has given approximately 2,000 years to the Gentile nations of the world. And the same thing is going to happen and is happening before our very eyes. The nations of the world by and large have rejected the gospel. The Western world has declined into a debauchery and an evil and an immorality probably not seen since the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and the days of Noah, just like Jesus said it would happen. Now, the early church is a type of what would happen at the end of time. And so when Peter addresses us and calls himself Peter, it is by the Spirit so that we would understand that what's about to be said is about to be said to the Gentile church. Peter wrote this letter in approximately A.D. 64. And there was a foreshadow or a type of the Antichrist who we can sense is in the wings in our time in his day. It was the Emperor Nero. Nero burned down the world, the imperial capital. He set it on fire. In AD 64 and he caused the Christian church to become the scapegoats he blamed them for the burning of the fire and the burning down of the city they became the central focus of the persecution of a global state of that time the Roman Empire and what he did was then turn the attention and the focus and the ferociousness of that Antichrist spirit on the early church and so when Peter writes, he writes as a foundation stone. I'm Peter. That's what his name means. I'm a, I'm a smaller stone chipped off the old block, so to speak. Jesus Christ himself, the cornerstone. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, he said. I'm sent to you. And who he writes to, in verse 1, is to the strangers that are scattered throughout all of Asia Minor. Why is that important? Because the same type of history is repeating itself understand this they were scattered because of the intense persecution that was rising that was coming and that was growing the edict had come down and that edict was now directed towards God's children and so they were scattered they were in different parts of the earth but God knew where they were and there was a trepidation there was a fear there was a continued anxiety growing in the culture of that day as it is now. And I know many of you have felt it. Some of you have loved ones, friends, people that maybe might not even speak about it. But there's an unease. There's a, there's a sense that, that the world, <laughs> and this is obvious, right? <laughs> there's something really wrong with the world, man. There's a lot going on that's crazy and it doesn't seem to make sense. But see, our anchor is the word of God. And so he writes to our brothers and sisters of that day. And he tells them this. He says, understand something. And this is something that I want you to understand. And I'm seeking to understand. He tells them, this crazy world you find yourself in. He says, you have been selected to live at this time. That's why he calls them the elect. And he says, you were elected according to the foreknowledge of God. The reason he says it that way is so that those who were up under incredible anxiety, under incredible fear, 
Their very lives were at stake. The ominous shadows of the, of the storm clouds were cascading across the known world of that day headed directly towards the Christians. So vicious was Nero that he used to uh, take the Christians and he would uh, dip animal skins in oil and then wrap the Christians in them, tie them to the stake so he could light the imperial gardens. That's how ferocious and vicious it had become. The result of this is that the fear was spreading throughout the church and everything that they believed was being tested. I'm here to tell you this morning, everything that we believe is going to be tested. We have been shielded and buffered from what our brothers and sisters have gone through for hundreds of years and really in earnest the last hundred years through the 20th century. We have pretty much by and large been shielded in the West from this kind of intensity. But the time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. And God is sending out his call trying to gather as many as he can into his church for what lies ahead. And Peter for the persecuted church of his time, a foreshadow of our time, is trying to tell them, understand one of the anchors of your soul is that you're going to need to allow the Holy Spirit and I'm going to need to allow the Holy Spirit to elevate myself into that transcendent understanding which only the Spirit can give. That I and you and the church of this hour has been elected to endure what is just ahead of us. It is coming. I'm not trying to be over dramatic and, and a bummer here, but this should, as we go into this, and, and, and I'll hurry and conclude here in a, in a little bit, but will bring us encouragement when we begin to see what he's actually saying to us. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, that because iniquity would abound, that the love of many would wax cold. What did he mean by that? He basically was telling us that such immoral decline, such injustice, such violence, such frenetic dark energy would be pervading in the last time that it would begin to wear away at the exterior of those who claim to be believers. And he said that if we didn't press in in these days, if we didn't seek him in these days, if we didn't diligently pursue him, in these days, our love, our fervency, our spiritual quality would begin to ebb away. This is far deeper than we have considered before. But what we're being told in these kinds of scriptures is that we need to create that buffer zone around us. And that is only done by putting on the whole armor of God, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18 in there. And that armor of God is the protective shield of God that is cultivated by you and me when we seek God every single day. Now for some, that's an extreme pursuit or maybe something that's not even been considered. But I'm talking to you who can hear by the Spirit of the Lord that what we are talking about is not a temporary world. Remember when Jesus stood trial with Pilate and he said, are you a king? And the Lord said, my kingdom is not of this cosmos, this world. Now, I know it is a popular thing in the church today to just gather together and just pump you up, right? You can do anything. You can be successful. All you got to do is don't give up. Don't quit. Follow and chase your dreams. All that kind of stuff. Well, that's good. That has its place. We all need to be encouraged. But we're not living in other uh, times that are normal here. We're living in prophetic times. And God is looking for serious people with serious walk. And he's inviting us to draw closer to him and to trust under the covert of his wings. We need to understand our mission and our purpose and the fact that we have been selected by God for such a time as this. And this is what he was telling them. You're scattered, you're running, you're scared. It's intense, what's happening? He says, but put the brakes on for a minute and begin to allow the Holy Spirit to elevate you into a higher form of transcendent spirituality in Christ our Lord. If you can receive it, he says, 
you, this generation of their time and now our generation, was foreknown by God. Yes, there's been saints throughout the, the centuries and the millennia and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to prophetic generations, they are selected. They are exclusive to the plan and the purpose of God. And therefore, they also are equipped with a great and mighty strength of the Spirit if they can receive it, if they will draw upon His strength. The first thing we need to understand is that you and I have been elected for this time. We weren't born a hundred years ago. We were born now. And so Peter is basically telling us, hey man, it's not like all of this is catching God by surprise. <laughs> and so it shouldn't catch us by surprise either, right? And, and we have to anchor ourselves in big picture type thinking. It's the only thing that will see us through. I was watching a, a, a movie the other day and they showed how the Christians were being persecuted and how they had to go down into the Roman Colosseum. To the outside looker, it seems absurd. What kind of religion is this that you would lay down your life? What kind of a morbid kind of, you talk about death and crucifixion and blood and all that kind of stuff. But see, to, to the foolish, to, to the Greek Paul said it's foolishness. And to the Jewish person, Jesus was a stumbling block. But he said, unto us who believe, we preach Christ crucified. And he is the power of God unto salvation. What does that mean? What is happening? What is all this intensity that is climaxing right now upon the face of the earth? As Paul described it, all creation is groaning. If you have half a spiritual sensitivity, you, you know it. And you sense it and you perceive it. But something is dying because something marvelous is coming. The kingdom of Almighty God. And I know you don't hear that in your churches, most of you. Uh, you know, we just don't hear that. We hear about how we can get rich, how we can have that trophy wife, how you can have that beautiful husband, how you can have 3.5 kids, all got straight A's and all went to Harvard or yet. I mean, whatever, man. It's such an American gospel. And it's so old. And it's so tiring. It has nothing but this world in mind. But Christ came, the apostles came, the prophets came to tell us that the whole world is broken, that creation itself is broken, and that the story that we find ourselves involved in at this very precise moment as we're speaking one to another, it's broken and it's coming to an end. But there's something marvelous coming. That's why he goes on to say, first of all, understand you've been selected for this moment and you have been known beforehand according to the foreknowledge of God. It's all part of his plan. Listen, I, I don't, don't, don't just hear what I said and let it go over your head. This is what Peter said. It's all part of his plan. The foreknowledge of God. All of it. There is a conflict that is raging. I know many of you have come out of a pseudo-spirituality, right? New Age movements, occult, all that kind of stuff, right? That we don't even talk about that. But there's a quality about you that is spiritual. That's why we went in the wrong directions. That's why we reached for something that, that transcended our mundane lives. We knew innately inside us because the Bible says God has stamped his fingerprint upon the interior of our soul. He's placed eternity within the heart. It's why we reach for things that are greater than ourselves. But the enemy and, and the philosophies of the world have flooded in trying to dissuade and trying to confuse or trying to lead astray from everything except for the truth. Jesus said you would know the truth and the truth will set you free. This foreknowledge of God, he says, this plan of God, it has been established since before ever the earth was. Go read Proverbs 8 on your own time. Check out some of the things that are said there. It speaks in multiple dimensions. It speaks in, in, in fascinating ways. And when it comes to the creation of the universe and the earth itself, all of it are component parts that are 
placed into existence for a desired end and a beginning. Something is happening. And that's why we see in the natural world now so many things going crazy. So God, God tells us through his apostle, understand we've been selected for this time and this was done way before God's in control. It was his foreknowledge. And then he says concerning you and concerning me, how we have been elected is through sanctification of the spirit. Understand this, that the Holy Spirit has been working on you since the day you were conceived in your mother's womb. You weren't an accident. You weren't born by happenstance. It wasn't, it, there's nothing accidental about anything that's happening. From the moment you were born, the Spirit of God was calling you to Himself. That's what the word sanctified means, to be separated. Not only were you selected for this time, he began the process of selecting you and drawing you by His Spirit to Himself. That was that. That's why you're saved today, or, or why maybe God's dealing with you, you don't even know why you're listening. It's the Spirit of God that's drawing you. He's separating you. And then He says, unto obedience. That's incredible because when you think about it in light of what we're talking about, this intense persecution, this prophetic time, that we're all up under and that they were under, obedience seems almost masochistic to the time. What are you asking me to actually do? If we don't understand it, we will fail at the moment that we need to stand because the heat will be too much. This privileged selection of generations who experience prophetic times, he says, requires obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience to the gospel, yes. But what does the gospel teach us? That our Father is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And from point A to point Z, there's a lot of stuff that's been happening throughout the ages. But as we get to the end, and each generation that preceded us, who is now, as Paul described them in Hebrews chapter 12, a great cloud of witnesses urging us to play our part, to take our position in the ranks of the armies of Almighty God, obedient with precision and spiritual accuracy and understanding that can only be ministered to us by the Holy Spirit that something is happening, something has happened, and something is about to come. He goes on to say, by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, we're not perfect. We're, we're in the process of being perfected. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us, washes us, and assures us that we have obtained the status of sons and daughters. Now let me hurry. So then he goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3, which according to his abundant mercy he has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What does all that mean, right? We can spend hours talking about this stuff, but listen, he's basically saying this. When we were born, all of us, if you will take the time to meditate upon it, he's basically telling them, look, and telling us, when we were born into this earth, we didn't have any hope. All we had to look forward to was, was death. And that's the question, brothers and sisters. That's the basic premise of all scripture. The death question. So when Peter is writing to these people that are up under heavy persecution, and he's writing to them and telling them, I know that it seems to you like your very life is hanging in the balance, and it is in this world. He, he, he goes on to say, God is blessed, Jesus is blessed, thank God for His abundant mercy, because He didn't leave us in this state. We were born in a world of, of decay and defilement and corruption. Everything dies. And God was telling us and is telling us that something profound far beyond our 
maybe deepest meditations to this point occurred when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That he began something new. And the reason that Jesus rose from the dead first is so that he would be the preeminent one, the only one worthy, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the name that is above every name. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will forever have preeminence. He is the Lord of glory. He is the only begotten of the Father. And Peter says, the anchor for your situation, the, the, the intensity of what we're all going through and are yet to go through according to the scriptures in the not too many days ahead, the hardships, the madness, everything that we're witnessing. He says, anchor yourself on the fact that your Lord, your Savior was resurrected from the dead. You don't serve a dead God. You serve a living, resurrected Savior and he is the King of glory. And that is going to be the anchor of our soul because what they're preaching to us, brothers and sisters, is another world, a world that is yet to come, a world that you know and sense in your heart is real and will grow more profoundly so as we approach the coming of the Lord, if we are in fellowship with him. Look what he says. He has, he has, he has caused us to live again because Jesus lives, we shall live also who believe in him. And he says, we have an inheritance now. It's that next world, that next dimension, that next expression of our Father. Void of sin, void of violence, void of Satan himself and his children, void of corruption, void of anxiety, void of depression, void of brokenheartedness and scattered relationships and addictions of all sorts. All of it is being dealt with. And he's bringing us to a new, pristine, perfect existence, a new dimensional expression of God, a new heaven, a new universe, a new earth, reserved for his children and the ages to come, all the blessed creatures that he's made throughout the ages. He says, look, you have an inheritance, and this time it's not corruptible, it's not defiled, and it will not fade away, and it's reserved in heaven for you and me. You know what that means, that word reserved? You look it up on your own time. It means that God's military forces are guarding your inheritance and my inheritance. This is a battle of a high nature that's taking place. That's why you see these high-level officials throughout the planet going absolutely nuts and insane and doing stupid stuff. Because they're, con they're controlled by satanic force. And there's a battle that's being waged, whether you can perceive it or not, in the heavens all around us. And it's now coming down to it, ain't it? <laughs> As they say in the Native American community, ain't it? Listen, man. He says there's an inheritance and it's protected. That's why Jesus said, lay up for yourself and myself treasures in heaven where moth and rust uh, don't corrupt it and thieves don't break through and seal. There is an army watching over your inheritance and there's an army watching over you. That's what he goes on to say. You're kept by the power of God through faith. That is what we assuredly believe in our hearts unto what? salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the time we're living in. Well, I thought I was saved. Yes, your soul is saved. The Holy Spirit has, has, has uh, sealed you, has, has meshed with your soul. You belong to Him. But Peter is talking about a greater salvation. The full salvation will be when all the enemies of heaven are absolutely defeated and destroyed. When all the political systems of the world have been burnt away, when all the kingdoms of this world come crashing down and every knee and shall bow and every tongue is going to confess on that day that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Blessed is his holy name. This salvation has not fully been revealed yet. That's why things are going crazy, because we're getting closer to those days. Now we have several months and maybe a few years ahead of us, but if we are where I think we are, then fasten your seatbelt and seek God and hold on, because it's going to get bumpy here. But let me tell you something. Remember when the children of Israel were about to come out of Egypt and what, what God had Moses do? 
He had him apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of their house. And everybody in the house, when the destroyer came through, was safe. Anyone outside the house where the blood applied, well, good luck. Our safety is in him. Everything is going to be tested and is being tested. Now, he says, this salvation we're talking about, he says, wherein you greatly rejoice. He says, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. What does he mean by that? This is what he means. Remember what we're talking about. Persecution, prophetic times, all this kind of stuff. Kind of time, times we're living under. He says this. He says, look, if need be. In other words, if it is our destiny, brothers and sisters, if we are living in these prophetic times, and we are, if you have if we have half a half a spiritual you know, barometer out there we know we're living in prophetic times he says if this is your destiny to endure these things he says <laughs> that the trying of your faith and my faith understand that it is more precious than of gold which perishes and though we be tried by fire let it be found unto the praise and honor and glory when Jesus appears. In other words, he said, this heat is going to expose what we are. And let us pray that when this heat continues to increase upon us, that what's going to be found is a genuine, bona fide child of the living God. Yes, the days are crazy. Yes, the days are going to get worse. But understand this, Jesus said, when you see these things beginning to come to pass, don't fret, don't freak out. He says, you plant your feet on solid ground, you square back those shoulders, and you look up because your redemption is drawing near. It is a time to get serious. I didn't mean to come back after all this time and be heavy with you, but I'm not trying to be. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to make some sense of what we're going through. Do not let yourself go to sleep. I don't need to lay out a list of things that we shouldn't be doing or should be doing or anything like that, man. All I can tell you is it's time to pray, it's time to seek God, and it's time to grow up, be sober, and watch. Because Jesus Christ is coming soon. But we also know what precedes His coming is an intense time. We need to prepare ourselves and our loved ones and our families for what lies ahead. The balance of this year is going to get crazy, man. You don't need to be afraid. You have been selected. I have been selected. The church of this hour has been selected for such a time as this. And the greater the intensity in the world, the greater the glory of God that shall be seen upon you and me and all those who love the Lord. He's coming soon. And understand this. He loves you. He's going to equip you. And he's going to see you and me through. Trust him today. We love you. And we thank you for praying for us as we pray for you. We hope to see you again next Sunday. And until then, you have a wonderful week. Take care of each other. Love one another. And seek the Lord daily. He'll strengthen you. He'll reveal to you exactly what you need to do. God love you. And like we say always, May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he bless and keep you in all the ways you go. And until we meet again, don't forget, always keep looking up. God bless you. We love you. See you next time.